1960s, social commentators began forecasting the demise of the American family. These commentators were alarmed by the skyrocketing divorce rate, offended by the hippie commune movement, shocked by the number of couples choosing to live together without being married, and horrified by the growing number of unwed teen mothers. By the mid-1970s, many Americans believed that the family was fading as an American institution. But now in the mid-80s, we see that the doomsayers of the 60s and 70s were wrong. Although the divorce rate remains high, stable marriage and remarriage rates indicate that most Americans still prefer married family life. Hi, I'm Gail Kimball, Coordinator of Women's Studies. And I'm Brad Glanville, Professor of Child and Family Studies. This is a program about contemporary American families. Families which, like living organisms, are changing and evolving into new and sometimes very different forms from those we've known in the past. A good starting point for this program is to define what constitutes a family. Many of us conceptualize a family as two adults with their children. But what about a single adult? with one child. Is that a family or two unmarried adults living together? The first point of this program is that from a structural point of view, there's a wide variety of family forms in America. This graph shows just how great that variety is. We can see that the traditional nuclear family, mother at home with children, while father is away working, is actually a minority of modern family types, less than 10%. More common family forms are dual earner and single parent families. The number of step families is also on the rise. Another way to think about families is in terms of the roles the members fulfill. For example, who fulfills the income producing or breadwinning role? Who does the housework or bread baking? Who cares for the children? We tend to think of some of these activities and responsibilities as belonging to the woman or man of the family. But as we shall see, for many couples today, there is nothing inherently male or female about doing home repairs or cleaning a toilet. These traditionally distinctive family roles have become blurred. Clearly, the American family is changing in the 1980s. In this program, we will discuss some of the major trends of change in today's families. Trends such as the increase in the number of mothers working outside the home, the high divorce rate, the increasing number of single parent and step families, the growing tendency to delay marriage and have fewer children, and finally, the increasing number of ethnic families. We asked some experts to comment on these trends and tell us what effects they'll have on the family. Most of the experts you'll see during the course of this video are therapists and authors. Dorothy Huntington, child psychologist. Emily Vischer, psychologist. John Vischer, psychiatrist. Diane Aronsaf, psychologist. Norma Radin, professor of social work. Robert Sayers, counselor, Virginia Satir, therapist and noted author. Some social scientists believe that the most influential change of the 20th century is the large-scale entry of wives and mothers into the labor force. In the late 1940s, only 10 percent of wives with children under six were in the labor force. In 1984, women composed 44 percent of the labor force. Over half of the children under 18 now have a working mother, and 49 percent of married women with children under six are in the labor force. An important result of this trend is an increasing pressure on husbands and fathers to become active participants in family life. What forces have propelled almost half the mothers of preschool children to seek employment outside the home? Certainly the economic climate has been important. Only about a quarter of today's jobs can support a family of four. Most families need two incomes just to meet basic needs. But don't forget that many men and women choose careers out of pressing needs for personal growth and professional achievement. The women's liberation movement has played an important role in changing attitudes about working mothers. 
Today, the single-parent family is the most rapidly growing family form. This figure shows that in the last decade, the percentage of single-parent families has more than doubled. In the 1990s, projections are that at least a quarter of all families will be headed by a single parent. The phenomenon of divorce is responsible for most of today's single parent families. Projections are that at least half of the marriages formed in this decade will end in divorce. It's no longer true that children are the glue that holds marriages together. About two-thirds of all divorce decrees will be granted to parents with children under 18, involving at least one million children each year. Obviously, divorce has a dramatic effect on family structure. Children and their fathers become separated. About 90% of the time, sole physical custody of the children is granted to the mother, although joint legal custody is on the increase. Just how difficult divorce will be for the children depends upon a number of factors. First, there's the degree of hostility between the mother and father. Bitter fighting between the parents makes adjustment more difficult. Second, the new economic environment for the children is significant. Unfortunately, for many, it is a change to poverty. Even though fathers are required to provide child support, many pay little or none of the court-ordered payments. For children, divorce can be a traumatic experience or a relatively minor setback. Its impact depends on the child's gender, level of emotional maturity, ability to understand, and coping style. In a recent interview with Dr. Dorothy Huntington, a child psychologist, she told us about the effects of divorce on children. Key to what I wish students would know, that there is no one impact of divorce on children that children go through divorce in very different kinds of ways, and that there are some children who really seem to go through without any major long-lasting effects. There are other children who obviously have more problems at the time of the divorce, and the impact lasts for a longer period of time. Also, another issue that students ought to know about is that what happens after the divorce has just as much impact on the children as what happens at the time of divorce. And what happens after divorce, I think primarily are two major relationships. One is the economic situation of whether the children are living in economic situations that are very, very different from what they were before. If a mother has custody of her children and is having a very difficult time making it financially, it's very difficult for the kids. Particularly, in and of itself, it's difficult for the kids, but it's particularly difficult for them if the mother is having a very difficult time and the father is not. It looks as if in the first year following divorce, and only talking about the first year, that mother's income, custodial mother's income, goes down about 60%, where in the same period of time, the father's income goes up about 40%. And that's a striking difference. Another effect of divorce on children that seems to me very powerful is that it often drives fathers away. I think the issue of the father disappearing, if you will, after the divorce has to do with a number of factors, that being primarily an issue of the father feeling, why should I come around? There's no place for me. Unfortunately, that's exaggerated by women who want to solve their own problems with the divorce by saying, I want to get rid of him. I never want to see him again. And they don't realize that that solution to the problem is the worst possible one for the children. What are the figures that you've seen in terms of um, what percentage of fathers remain close contact with their children? Well, the nationwide studies, one year post-divorce, is that about 42% of children or even a bit more, let's say half of the children, no longer have contact with their fathers. Divorce is the primary, but not the only reason why the number of single parent families has increased so markedly. A second source of single parent families is the growing number of unwed and never married mothers. Many women who might have chosen abortion or adoption in the past now choose to have and keep their children. In 1981, one in every five babies was born to an unmarried woman. Approximately 12% of white, 24% of Hispanic, and 56% of black babies were born outside of marriage. In 1983, 
unmarried mothers gave birth to almost half a million infants. The quality of family life is influenced by income. And unfortunately, the percentage of single parent families living below the poverty line is enormous. Three quarters of the black and Hispanic children in single mother families live in poverty. More than half of the 12 million children who live in families headed by women are living in poverty. Poverty is particularly likely when the unwed mother is a teenager who dropped out of school. For most children of divorce, life in a single parent family is usually a transitional phase. About two thirds of them will be back in a two parent family within three years and 80% by five years after the divorce. Currently, Remarried spouses make up about 20% of all families, and about one of every four children lives in a step family. This family type, with its complicated network of old and new relationships, is very different from an intact family. These remarried families have been popular material for films and television comedy and dramas, such as The Brady Bunch and Eight is Enough. The problem is that the perception we gain from television does not adequately reflect the complexity of life in remarried families. Emily Fisher is a psychologist and John Fisher is a psychiatrist. We asked them to discuss some of the misperceptions about step families. They said that a common myth is that a second marriage will be very much like a first marriage. But in fact, they're very different. As step-parents, they each brought four children to their marriage and both counsel and co-author books for step-families. We thought that because we both were in the mental health field, we uh, would know about feelings and we'd be able to iron things out quickly. But we came to realize, in fact, our children taught us that uh, it's not that simple and that people uh, who uh, get remarried have a lot of work to do, really, to uh, kind of uh, sort out all the things that are involved, partly because step families have a different structure in many respects than biological families. Uh, for example, you see everybody gets together after there's been a, many, many changes in their lives. Uh, there's been a loss in a relationship between parents and children after the divorce or a death of a spouse, and people come together knowing exactly the children as well as the adults how well, in our case, how the spaghetti should be cooked, how the marshmallows should be cooked, toasted, and negotiating. It takes time. It's the time, I think, people, and we certainly were unprepared for that, and I think this is true of so many step families. They expect that they can work all these things out quickly, but uh, you're used to the way that you have done it, and all of a sudden, in fact, you haven't given it any thought, and there's somebody doing it differently. Then you see you have the parent-child relationships that have been there longer than the new couple. That's a complete reversal from a biological family. Another thing is you have a parent, a biological parent in another household or in memory, and you have children very often going back and forth between two households. And that's a complication, a complex structure that can make for great differences. You have to get used to those transitions. Also, you see the complexity can make for very good things, such as a diversity and uh, the opportunity to see things done differently. Is that the reason why there's a 57% divorce rate in second marriages? Well, because of the complexity. I think the complexity has a lot to do with it. And uh, you have people who are coming together who really don't have a bond yet between, very strong bond between them, uh, the adult couple. One of the complexities facing step families is holidays. Six-year-old Jed lives in a single parent family and has a father and a stepmother. This is what he told me about celebrating Christmas. Who did you have your first Christmas with? Papa and Mama's, my Valentine's. And who are they? My mom's parents. And where was your second Christmas? I bought bananas. And who are they? My dad, I mean, my cousins. And where else did you have Christmas? Bought bananas. And who are they? My dad's parents. You had a lot of Christmases, huh? Mm -hmm. And they also had Christmas at home. 
Another emerging trend affecting families is that people are delaying marriage until they're older. The median age at first marriage for women has risen from 20.3 years old in 1960 to 22.8 years in 1983. Add to this fact that teenage marriages are declining and the result is a phenomenon of mature parents. Older parents are more likely to want their child and to have fewer children. The average rate is 1.8 children. We asked Janet and Bill Hayes, both physicians, to explain the advantages of delaying parenthood. I, uh, I think the major advantage was uh, being convinced that uh, the timing uh, was, was right. And what I mean is, is I had done a lot of things as a single person and uh, as, a, as a young married person, like travel and uh, be a little more uh, freewheeling with my time and had felt an, an impulse to uh, become more rooted and settled. Um, I think that uh, after I had children, I realized that uh, you are less mobile. <laughs> Some are more mobile, and uh, I was less mobile. And I didn't miss being able to do things on the spur of the moment. I got to As I might have uh, if we'd had uh, children earlier. I might add that postponing having children basically gave Janet and I a chance to uh, get to know each other better and be more mature parents when the time did come to have children. In addition, it gave us a chance to enjoy our own lives without the uh, work involved to bring up kids. Another important trend in America today is the growing number of ethnic and minority families. The percentage of minority families is increasing at such a rate that in some major cities such as Los Angeles, Whites have become a minority. Ethnic groups will comprise almost half of California's population by the year 2000. We need to learn more about family patterns among various ethnic minorities. Extended families are more common among minority groups. The majority of black families are headed by a single woman, for example, but her family often lives nearby and helps in child rearing. We ask Sylvia Lopez Romano to characterize Hispanic families. But the family is more valued. Um, sometimes the families are larger. Um, you have what we call um, a lot of generations uh, interacting together. And uh, one of the things that is, has always been said or, or that's interesting is that uh, it's been said that education in Hispanic families are not, is not as valued. Um, and I think perhaps that that goes back to the family structure in terms of the responsibility that uh, you're sort of brought up with. Uh, you're brought up with the idea that um, when you get older, while you're young, your parents are taking care of you. When you get older, then the responsibility shifts so that you are then responsible for your parents. And this even extends to, um, to the high school level in a lot of cases with the young males and with the young uh, ladies because they either have to be home to help with the kids babysitting while their parents work, or they have to add uh, some income to the family. And so as they get to be 15 or 16 years old, often the kids, the boys especially, will drop out of school. We know that ethnic families are poor. A recent study found that 46.1% of black children, 38.7% of Hispanic children, and 13% of white children live in families with incomes below $10,000 a year. This section has profiled major changes in American families. The majority of mothers now work outside the home. The divorce and remarriage rates are high. People are delaying marriage and children. And the number of ethnic minority families is growing. Next, we'll look at the changing roles in today's families. In the past, we tended to think of the husband's role in the family as an instrumental one, providing income and leadership, while the wife's role was thought to be the nurturing one maintaining the house and raising children. This division of labor is characteristic of the traditional nuclear family and was a popular topic for television programs in the 50s and 60s. Popular programs such as Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver, and The Donna Reed Show reinforced stereotyped attitudes about family roles. However, today, only about 20% of children experience life in this kind of family. 
there is a growing trend towards greater diversification in family styles. Today, more and more young married couples are choosing to share the instrumental and nurturing roles. In fact, the majority of Americans under 40 tell pollsters they believe in role sharing. Today, perhaps 15% of couples actually achieve equality in their roles at home. The first studies of pioneering role sharing, or egalitarian couples as they were called, was launched in the 1970s. Diane Aronsaft, a psychologist, has interviewed role sharing couples. At a recent Chico State Conference, she reported that the women's liberation movement seems to be a significant factor in the decision to role share. I didn't have to probe very far to find out that the overwhelming majority of the parents I spoke to had been influenced either directly or indirectly by the women's movement. Uh, what asked when asked what influenced their decision to co-parent, a great number of the parents, both the women and the men, spoke first of the large impact of the women's movement and the social unrest and political activities of late 60s, early 70s. Prior to giving any thought about whether they were ever going to be parents, these parents in their early adulthood had begun to grapple with the issues of sexism, of inequality, both in a larger society and in their own lives. Now, they came from a particular spectrum of society, so they're not typical. They came from a spectrum which was socially aware and wanted to make sweeping changes in the way things were. As one mother put it, both of us were in groups that were going to change the world. A bit grandiose, but that was the notion of what they were going to do. Another major reason couples come to role share is through remarriage. Role sharing seems more common in step families than in intact families. Emily Vischer tells us that often, when a first traditional marriage was unsatisfactory, both partners in the second marriage are careful to negotiate a better relationship. She also cites another reason for more equality in a second marriage. I think one of the reasons that it would just naturally happen too, be much more likely to, is that both of those adults may have been for a time head of a household. And one of the things that you need to work out in the step families when you get together and you both have been head of household, how are you going to combine this? I remember one situation as an example where both the man and the woman enjoyed shopping, enjoyed cooking. And how are they going to work this out? See, there are all these things just daily, things that come up that people don't think about. So they actually had a lot of negotiating to do because they both wanted to do it. If I remember correctly, the way they negotiated was they took a week at a time and one was responsible one week and one the next. Families are rapidly changing and social science lags behind. Much more research is needed on shared parenting and father involvement. At a recent Chico conference, Norma Radin of the University of Michigan pointed out that in the past, many prominent social scientists did not even consider role sharing a possibility. Had a university based meeting been held 20 years ago, it's almost certain that the focus would have been on some aspect of maternal influence. The views of respected authorities of the day would have supported that perspective. For example, in 1956, Bettelheim said, quote, the relationship between father and child never was and cannot now be built around child caring experiences. It is a built around man's function in society, moral, economic, and political. Sometimes becoming a parent can make role sharing difficult, as Diane Aronsaf found when she interviewed egalitarian parents. Men and women who have successfully negotiated the equal distribution of household tasks don't fare so well when the first baby comes. Data collected by Phil and Carolyn Cowan in the UC Berkeley Becoming a Parent Project indicated that many parents reverted back to a more traditional relationship after the birth of their child despite plans to share before the baby was born. The role-sharing couple must struggle to negotiate new gender roles within the family, usually without role models to follow, and often without the approval or support of their parents, neighbors, and employers. For egalitarian couples, the benefits, though, seem worth the struggle. Couples that I interviewed said they appreciate having a spouse who's a best friend and respected equal partner. Also, sharing roles leads to a greater flexibility and closer family ties. Fathers like feeling close to their children. Janet and Bill Hayes, a dual career couple, 
commented on their experiences. Look at it from two standpoints. Professionally, it's actually very good because she can relate to my work and I tell her about things I've done, which is interesting to her. So that, that's a, a good aspect of it. As far as home life's concerned, uh, it's a little difficult to come home with having no uh, meal prepared or someone waiting with a martini. But uh, before we got married, I realized that would be the case and I accepted it as that. So we just have special time together to make up for the shortcomings. We don't have a system worked out. It's a system in evolution and it seems that each day is a new challenge and I don't want to give the idea that we've found some uh, miracle way to extend the hours and uh, we never have the conflicts. The conflicts come up all the time. Um, and I think that the general approach uh, is probably headed by keeping a sense of humor about the problems and uh, trying to keep them in perspective. Something that I'm not very good at, but Bill is very good at, uh, so that when we come into conflict with scheduling, um, we first try to decide what's the most important thing and work down from there. Robert Sayers, a counselor who works with fathers, explains how individual fathers can become more involved. On two levels, I think that, you know, on a behavioral level, they can just become more involved. You know, you just kind of have to throw yourself into it. And then I, I think that um, through the contact with, that fathers develop with their child, unique from the contact they have in their relationship with their wife or a partner, and with the contact that they have with other men who are trying to explore these kind of things, they can discover some of that male side. And, and I, because I don't think that mothers and women can help men that much with it. And I don't say that in any way to help separate them. I'm just saying that as much as women want to help men, they can't help them in that way. And in, a, in fact, the more they try to help, the more they basically subvert the, 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 the little growing parts of the male's discovery and sort of pull him back into more of a maternal or a female mode. And so, th so the work that has to be done almost is in the relationship between the male and the female. But in terms of what a father can gain in terms of understanding about parenting, I think he's got more to learn from his children than he does necessarily from his mother or from his wife. With his wife, he has to do some work in terms of the male-female relationship and what that means. But I don't know that, you know, he, I don't think that he can take his modeling from his wife. Um, and that isn't to say that we both don't model after each other and learn how to complement each other and how to fill in and understand our weaknesses and strengths. That's all part of the behavioral part of it. But in terms of a real self-discovery, I think that's got to come from the relationship with his child, within himself, and possibly from the support of other men as fathers in the community they're growing. What effects do shared parenting and increased father involvement have on children? How will children's gender identity and social development be affected by this? One of the first to look for such effects was Dr. Norma Radin. As far as sex role development, it appears that for the boys, the adoption of a traditional male sex role is not affected by fathers performing traditionally female functions in the home. The findings also suggest that the male gender role is adopted even in preschoolers whose fathers have traditional or tend to have more traditional female traits. Dr. Radin also told us that increased father involvement seems to boost the children's intellectual development. For sons, having a nurturing father seems to improve their thinking and problem-solving abilities. For daughters, increased father involvement apparently leads to higher verbal abilities. In their change towards role sharing, families need the help of social support systems. Let's look at how various institutions can help modern families. The courts are beginning to grant joint custody and sole custody of children to fathers. Dorothy Huntington, an expert on divorce, tells us more about joint custody, a significant trend which seems to keep fathers involved with their children. You know, California has the experiment now of giving joint legal custody much more than any other state in the United States. And it's going to be fascinating to see whether the concept of joint legal custody is enough to keep fathers involved. 
But certainly, I think joint legal custody gives fathers a sense of really belonging there. But I would hope that we're not just relying on the legal basis of keeping fathers involved, but that will change our whole approach in society of getting across to fathers that they are extremely important to their children and therefore get them to keep contact with their children. It's an interesting situation where the California is going to have a different phenomena post-divorce than uh, any other state. What percentage is it now that, that of families who are divorced who are awarded joint legal custody? About 40% of the awards in California now are for joint legal custody, whereas only about 5% are for joint physical custody. Schools can provide extended daycare and latchkey programs, classes to teach boys and girls basic domestic skills. At work, employers can offer more flexible working hours and develop permanent part-time jobs, job sharing, parental leave, and child care benefits. What we really need is a whole system of social supports. Being able to talk to people about what you're going through and getting ideas about how to do it best that we don't provide right now. To close our examination of changing families, we asked well-known family therapist and author Virginia Satir her projections for families in the year 2000. We need to find out how to love each other, how to, how to build with one another, whether we're husbands and wives or brothers or sisters or colleagues. We need to know how to, to help our humanness be manifest. And that's the real issue. And of course, the family is a microcosm of the world. See, the sadness with me and the hope with me is human beings who are made by such miracles. And what stands between us and manifesting our miracleness? It's only what we've been taught. And that can change, and that's where all the hope comes from. Today, families are assuming many forms, with dual earner married couples, single parents and step families far outnumbering traditional nuclear families. Sex roles in the family are becoming more fluid as wives continue to enter the workforce and men become more nurturant. If predictions are accurate, you are likely to work most of your adult life, marry and have 1.8 children, divorce and remarry. An informed understanding about family patterns will enable you to make intelligent choices about your future.